Hello, hello. Um, we're back again. I'm Vigda's daughter, otherwise called Erin. Either one is fine. Today we're going to talk about altars, tools, ritual garb, and doing it. Uh, the way to describe all this is this is the stuff you, you're putting together all your uh, necessary ingredients before you bake the cake. I know, I talked about spells and I talked about um, energy work and I talked about all that exciting stuff that you really want to get into. But all this needs to happen first. Uh, as I put these videos together, you are welcome to skip through whatever you want. It's your choice. However, I would suggest watching them in order because a lot of what comes later builds on what came before. Just a thought. So, let's talk altars. First of all, altars is spelled with two A's. There is no E. If you're spelling altar with an E, that's something very, very different. And you need to be mindful of this. Words have power, not in some esoteric sense, because uh, if you know someone's true name, you'll have power over them. That's not a thing. That's, that is uh, fairy tales and old wife stories. Where the power for, of words comes from, it comes from their meanings. Meaning is what defines the word. It's what makes it useful to communicate with other people. If you say the sky is orange and you mean it is blue, Orange becomes a useless word. It doesn't help. It doesn't do the job of communicating what you're trying to convey. So just be mindful. Be careful of your spelling. And I say that as someone who is an absolutely atrocious speller and has to rely on spell check. I love spell check. Uh, also, you will find that a number of people will simply walk away, uh, metaphorically speaking, if your post contains altar with an E. It's, it denotes a certain lack of effort on your part. So, just, just one of those things that you should probably hang on to in the back of your mind. Uh, on the subject of altars, why do you need one? It sounds like a silly question, but you'd be amazed how many people can't actually answer it. The first thing you do is you do need to answer that question. You need to say why you need that. Why you want an altar is going to impact on how you put it together, uh, what you use it for, all that. It's, it's again like, I've said before in the past, know where you're going. You need to know how things are supposed to look. What is the end game? Uh, there are many kinds of altars, and this is where I am very sorry for my lack of uh, tech savvy, because I have absolutely no idea how to splice pictures into my videos. Uh, so I'll probably See if I can add some pictures into the comment section or the about section for this video, just so you can have some ideas. Altars come in every shape and size you can possibly imagine. Uh, there are three basic uses. There is the, the workspace, in which case this is where you put your spells together where you uh, do all, all your little things to bring about the result you want. It's essentially, if you think in terms of cooking, it's the clear countertop where you can roll out your pastries. That's all it is, that's your altar. It's a place to contain tools that you're going to need in your endeavors and a place to uh, be able to do what you need to do without crashing and banging into other things. Uh, the next time, the next type is, uh, is a, uh, place of worship. It is a place where you, uh, 
recognize and honor deities or entities, uh, ancestors, anything that you feel you need to, uh, to have a connection with. Um, you can absolutely have that set up with pictures of people who have passed, uh, with items that represent whatever it is you're worshiping. Uh, there's lots of beautiful statues out there of assorted gods, but again, don't get it if you can't afford it. Really, honestly, don't do it. Um, but, and how you decorate that can get very, very personal. Uh, if you are part of a tradition that, and your tradition says you set up an altar this way, stop that you don't need my advice you don't need to ask anyone online you need to talk to the person within your tradition and get it from them what it's supposed to look like so what this uh, video is assuming that you're not in a tradition that you're just doing your own thing and you're trying to figure out as you go so i will continue on in that vein uh which means there are no hard and fast rules. Um, the third type of altar is, how would I, I'm trying to think of how I would describe this. Uh, this is a common thing that you will run into when it comes to uh, esoteric ideas. They don't always translate to words very well. Um, your third kind of altar is sacred space. It is, it is a place where you are between worlds, between times. Um, it's, it's way more than a worship altar. Cause when you're worship, when you're worshiping, uh, when you're giving, um, uh, thanks or when you are honoring anything, you are still very much part of this world, your daily life. That's, and that's fine. That's totally okay. Uh, your, your between worlds, it's, it's something else. It's, again, really hard to describe. Um, there's a term, betwixt and between. And you will hear that a lot from uh, old school witches. And it refers to a liminal space that is uh, between the now and the future. Uh, it's a place where everything is in flux and you can use that uh, possible space that is all possibility in your workings. Uh, so this can be very much a part of your uh, workspace, but then you're starting to cross over ideas and it gets confusing very quickly. So, um, those are the three basic types, and yes, you can mash them together. Yes, you can have all three in one altar, if that's what you want. Uh, as long as you know how that's going to work, you can go for it. Uh, your altar generally contains your tools, whether this is representation of the gods or uh, fresh cut flowers to, uh, to denote that it's spring, or um, or fancy athames and wands uh, to aid you in, in casting spells. Uh, tools are a big part of things. When you're starting out, I really, really do recommend that you have all the bells and whistles. This doesn't mean you have to go and spend a whole lot of money. It means you should have everything that makes sense to you in your practice. Um, and the reason for this is there's a pragmatism in having, oh, a cast iron cauldron. It's, you can burn things in it. It's great. And yeah, it's a nice witchy aesthetic too. Um, the, but uh, it's a practical thing. And if you can't find a 
a uh, cast iron cauldron, that's okay. There's all kinds of other burn proof uh, things that you can you can use in your rituals. Uh, cast iron cauldrons are also great because you can use them for uh, mirror scrying. And I'll talk about that in another time. Um, something that is often useful is a notebook. Write down what you're trying to accomplish. Write down what, uh, what actually happened in your efforts. Write down any kind of uh, phase of the moon, your moods, anything that could possibly uh, be affecting whatever it is you're trying to do. Whether it's honoring something or it's trying to uh, curse someone's ass. All of the more information, the better. Um, you can have wands. This is a very simple wand that I made when I was starting out. It has some symbols on it. It's got the vines and it's made out of apple wood. Um, wands are one way to direct energy. So you probably want a wand. You can also make wands. That's so easy. Uh, just go to your favorite park, look for a fallen branch, um, generally because there's all kinds of restrictions on what you can cut down in parks. So be very careful about that. Uh, if you own property or know someone who does, maybe you can go find something there. Uh, you, it doesn't have to be jewel encrusted. If you want to put a, uh, a stone on it or you want to paint it or you want to include feathers or whatever you think is useful go for it it's your wand make it however you want um what else is useful on an altar uh how about an offering bowl i found this guy at a uh, at a new age shop actually um i don't remember what kind of wood it is but the bowl itself is uh, non-porous and it is waterproof. So any kind of uh, offering I want to put in it for whatever is just fine. Um, something else I have on my altar. A chime. Believe it or not, chimes are extremely useful. Uh, I know it's not one of the things that you're going to see a lot in in the books and that's fine. The reason why I have chimes on my altar is because I use chimes when I'm cleansing a space. Uh, hitting a chime will shake loose energetic gunk and then it makes it much easier to cleanse a space. Uh, you can also use chimes to denote uh, different phases of a given working or ritual. Uh, you can use chimes in meditation. And you can absolutely do meditation at your altar space. That should be no no problem. Uh, but then again, you can also meditate wherever you want. We'll talk about that one later too. Um, what about a thaw maze? Everyone loves a good ritual life. See, it's so cute. Well, it's entirely up to you if you want one. If you do, why not? If you don't, you don't need one either. And it's just another tool to use to, uh, to direct and cut energy is essentially all it is. So you can decide if you want one. Uh, the part that I tend to get people really riled up with is my athome. I don't think it's technically an actual athome because the th athome is a Wiccan tool. I'm not Wiccan. Also, an athome is supposedly supposed to be blunt. It's not supposed to cut things other than energy. My athame is very, very sharp and it does cut things. I am, I am not one of these people who is going to have two different knives when one does the job. Works fine. 
if you want to have two knives, if you want to have an actual chopping knife, that's called a bolin. It's a white handle knife and you can absolutely do that. You can have your blunt tethome and you can have your sharp bolin. Entirely up to you. Uh, again, I really do recommend that beginners have all the things. <laughs> I know I just said don't buy all the things, but tools are very useful for beginners because it helps you get in the right mind space. It, get, it convinces your uh, rational mind that yes, we are doing something that is out of the norm. It's something different. And it just helps you get into the right frame of mind for working magic. So that's why I recommend that you have tools. You don't need to have expensive things. A lot of things you can get at thrift stores or you can get at, at garden shops or you can get at, uh, at wherever. You, you don't have to go and slap down $300 for that uh, jewel encrusted uh, wand at the local pagan shop. You don't. It's nice. And if you can support local crafters, absolutely more power to you. But you don't have to do that. So. Uh, something else that is really, really helpful for getting you in the right mind space is ritual garb. Ritual garb can be incredibly fancy and elaborate and absolutely sumptuous and also costing a freaking arm and a leg. Uh, if you're not good at sewing, store-bought is fine. <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely welcome to go and buy your ritual garb from uh, wherever. There's plenty of online stores. Uh, cosplaying online shops is a great resource for ritual garb. It's generally a lot cheaper than, uh, than things that are being marketed to pagans and witches. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really up to you what that's going to look like. You can have ritual garb that is a pair of leggings and a specific t-shirt that you wear when you're doing ritual. That is ritual garb. That is the definition of ritual garb. It's what you wear when doing ritual. So as long as it's something that is special to you that tells you okay, we are doing something uh, ritual and magic-like. Perfect. That's all it has to accomplish. And what about skyclad? You hear that a lot. Uh, skyclad means naked. And the reason for working skyclad traditionally was to put all the members of a coven on the same footing. Uh, so it didn't matter that you could afford a Rolex. It didn't matter that uh, you could wear uh, Gucci. It didn't matter that your handbag was uh, Louis Vuitton because these things weren't present in, uh, in ritual because everyone's naked. Uh, so yeah, if you're on your own and you want to be naked while you do ritual, you go right ahead. If you are in a group with uh, others and they do sky clad, if you're comfortable with it, absolutely. If you're not comfortable, figure out why you're not comfortable. Is it a mental block? Do you have body issues? Uh, is it uh, old uh, prudish teachings that are rearing their ugly head? Okay, we can work on that. We can get you through that. Uh, and if you and if you're honest with the people that uh, you're ritualing with, they will help you. They will absolutely help you. If they don't help you, that is a big red so red flag, and you need to walk away. If you're uncomfortable because someone in the group seems to be sexualize, sexualizing the nudity, that's a whole different ball of wax. 
and you have every right to say no thank you. You are not there to be someone's sex object. No one is there to be a sex object for you. So if you want to uh, to do sky clad, that's great. If you are in a situation where you are not comfortable, you can say no. You can walk away. There's no one can force you. And if anyone tries to blackmail you uh, in any way, shape, or form to join in, run. Run far, run fast, and tell people what happened. We have a big problem in the witchcraft and pagan community in that a lot of sexual misconduct gets swept under the rug because we're really terrified that uh, the normal people would get wind of it and think that, oh, that's what all pagans do or what all witches do. And we've got to get over it because we have created a culture where uh, sexual bullshit thrives. So tell people. Tell people long, tell people loud, spread it everywhere. Put it on social media. As long as you've, you're being factual with what your experience is, go for it. Absolutely 100% go for it. A good, um, a good group is going to look at the situation and is going to listen to all sides and you're, and you, at the end of the day, whether someone believes you or not, you are in charge of what you can you can and can't do. If you can't ritual with someone because you're uncomfortable with, it, with them, then don't do it. Really don't do it. Ritual garb can also be makeup. Believe it or not, you could have a special eyeshadow or a special lip gloss, and that can be ritual garb. You can be, you could have just got in from work, you could be gross, you could be exhausted, you put on that, that lip gloss and all of a sudden, bam, you're in the headspace. That's how it's supposed to work. You need to work up to that and that's why we start with the big fancy uh, and elaborate ritual garb. But it's okay. Just use what works because it's going to be your path. It's got to be what is functional for you. So we've talked altars, we've talked tools, and we've talked ritual garb. I am going to get into uh, how to do energy work. I am going to tell you how to do spells. We are going to get there. What I want you to understand right now is you, there's lots of books to read. There's all kinds of books that will, on pretty much every subject you can imagine. Uh, for example, I have this book on tools. It's a lovely little book. It's uh, by this gentleman here, uh, Carl Neal. And it just covers a lot of very common things. It's not going to cover everything. And it's not very in-depth. But it's, um, it's going to help you figure out how you want to, uh, to put things on your altar. What's important? What is necessary? Excuse me just a minute. Um, but once you've read books, then you've got to put what you've read into practice. You've got to do it. Having all the theory in the world isn't going to make any difference if it never leaves your head. So get your hands dirty, get your feet dirty, and just do it. That is the biggest thing to remember. 